Now, today we're going to look at this Seagram work, which uh, yeah, I'm third author of. Um, it was led by Damla, who led the original Genasm work already. Um, and you will see many of the uh, Genasm authors repeated here. Um, that's because it's, it's closely related to these uh, prior works of Genasm and well, Scrooge was really developed in parallel. Um, but uh, yeah, Seagram is closely related to this because it, it's um, using basically the Genasm algorithm generalized to graphs as part uh, of its algorithm. And then it does some other things as well. So uh, let me uh, start though with a quick overview of what we're doing again. So recall that uh, in genome sequencing, we determine the DNA in an organism's genome um, and this plays a pivotal role in multiple applications such as personalized medicine, outbreak tracing, and the understanding of evolution. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, modern sequencing machines um, extract only small randomized fragments of the genome. We call them reads. And depending on the technology that we use, these can be uh, a few hundred base pairs or characters if you're uh, being computer scientists. Um, at, at small error rates, or there can be very long reads from thousands or millions of characters um, with high error rates. And well, more recently, then there can also be long reads with low error rates and, and so on. Uh, but anyway, the, the reads are diverse and our uh, algorithms also need to be able to handle this. Now, when you look at the entire pipeline here, we start with some physical steps. So it, this is a sequencing machine in top left. Then we would usually do a read mapping and variant calling, which are both computational steps. And finally, we can uh, look at the results of variant calling for scientific discovery um, or maybe medical decisions. Uh, this entire pipeline, it turns out, is bottlenecked in mapping. So if you have the throughput of a sequencing machine in basis per minute, and this is much higher than uh, the computational throughput of mapping. So we can generate data faster in that machine than we can um, analyze it computationally. So uh, clearly we need some kind of acceleration of the mapping uh, process. Um, now, uh, we could do what we've been doing, uh, let's say for the last few lectures here, we could do a mapping to a, a linear reference genome. So as you see here, we have uh, one reference sequence and one read, as, as we've seen it also in, in the prior lectures like uh, Genasm Scrooge. Um, the problem here is that um, it's really incorrect to have one reference genome. So consider your genome and my genome, and um, they will be different in some places. Um, and we don't know really before mapping which is the right genome to compare to. So um, if we only have one reference genome, it will overemphasize uh, one specific example reference, maybe mine, maybe yours, maybe some third person, um, but it will overemphasize uh, that one reference and it will ignore uh, all alternative uh, reference genomes. So an alternative reference genome comes from genetic variations. Um, and those would be completely ignored in a liver linear reference. Mm. However, the advantage here is that this is a very well studied problem. This sequence to graph, uh, sequence to sequence mapping, it's very well studied. There are many accelerators. We can do it fairly efficiently these days. Um, but this issue of having only one linear reference, um, which introduces something we call reference bias. So this idea of overemphasizing one reference, it's called reference bias. Um, that's really the main downside of this approach. Now, alternatively, we can go to a graph-based reference where we encode all alternate uh, variations or all alternative uh, sequences into a single reference. Um, but instead of a, just a single string, now we have a graph. And this makes it a more uh, difficult computational problem um, and also the yeah, it makes it such that hardware is a bit harder to design for it. However, it has a much better uh, quality in the mapping results. So if you have a reference graph, which just contains all the references that you could hope for, 
um, you will get better mapping results than with a single linear reference where you will get a reference bias. So in this work, the goal was to build a specialized, high performance, scalable and low cost um, algorithm hardware co-design that alleviates the bottlenecks in multiple steps of sequence to graph mapping. So just to contrast this again to the works we looked at last week in uh, Genesis and Scrooge, those focused on pairwise sequence alignment in the um, extension step in the read mapping uh, pipeline. This work uh, tries to do full read mapping. That's why we're saying multiple steps here. It accelerates both seeding and pairwise sequence alignment. Uh, so we proposed to this end CGRAM, the first universal algorithm hardware co-design uh, accelerator that uh, algorithm hardware co-designed genomic mapping accelerator um, and uh, why is it called universal? Um, so it can do a sequence to graph mapping, this yeah, much more complex task that we just looked at. It can also do sequence to sequence mapping still, so the traditional task. Um, and then it can also do both short and long reads. So that's why we're calling it universal. It can work for both, um, let's say, computational problems that we're considering, and it can work for uh, any kind of data set that we're considering. So we have three main use cases for CGRAM. It can be used for sequence to graph mapping, and then it can be used for sequence to graph alignment as well as sequence to sequence mapping. Um, and we see significant speed ups, such as by yeah, 5.9x up to 106x, depending on the data set. So we get a better, bit better speed ups for short reads. Um, and we also get significant uh, power improvements over prior software solutions. Note that the um, baselines here are kind of limited. In particular, we don't have any harder baselines here because um, there just weren't any uh, graph uh, mapping accelerators at the time. Um, so yeah, this goes kind of hand in hand with this point of this problem being much more difficult um, to solve and also to hardware accelerate. But yeah, basically over software, we get benefits as we should as a hardware accelerator. Um, then for sequence to graph alignment, uh, there are also significant benefits even over, even over highly optimized software libraries. And then for sequence to sequence alignment, so this well-known um, computational problem with many existing accelerators, over there we can compare to hardware accelerators. And we observe that uh, we, we get higher um, throughput than uh, yeah, state-of-the-art baselines such as uh, Genasm and uh, GACT of the Darwin Accelerator. Um, then again, for short reads, uh, we have the Silex uh, pairwise sequence aligner, um, which is also outperformed by uh, Seagram. So yeah, we're seeing improvements for over both uh, software baselines when there's no hardware baseline available, and we're seeing uh, improvements over hardware baselines in the cases where there is at least hardware available. Okay, um, so that was supposed to be a, a short overview. Now let's go into a more detailed background, um, mainly over graph mapping and why we need it. So recall that a reference genome is really a long string of ACGT characters. So for a human, this would be something like 3 billion characters, or if you use one byte per character, that's about 3 gigabytes. Um, now, I'm going to visualize this. The data structure is, is really a string, but I'm going to visualize it for the moment right now to give you an intuition um, as this kind of vacuum salesman. And this vacuum salesman has an eye color, he has a specific face shape, Maybe he has some allergies that we, we can't see that in the picture, but maybe he does have it. And all of those would be determined by the contents of his genome, um, assuming the reference genome is specifically that guy's genome. Um, yeah, so if the reference genome corresponds to the full picture, then reads would correspond to small fragments of the picture. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, each small fragment or each small picture, each read corresponds to exactly one feature, rather it corresponds to substrings of the entire string of these 3 billion characters. Um, but uh, let's just follow the abstraction of the 
uh, pictures for the moment, we're getting small fragments of the larger puzzle picture. Um, now, each of these fragments would be 150 to 2 million characters. And uh, the key issue here is that the origin locations of each of these fragments is unknown. So recall that this is the key challenge in read mapping. Um, when we do sequence to sequence mapping, even we try to find essentially where the origin location is of each of these fragments in the reference genome, according to one reference genome. Um, so this is solved by many, well, not solved, but many, there exist many hardware accelerators for this. Um, in particular, as I said, again, this Genasm and uh, Scrooge algorithms and hardware accelerators, uh, but many others um, solve this yeah, fairly well-known problem. So keep this picture in mind. Um, now let's go towards graphs from this picture. So um, I changed something here. Relative to the previous picture, I made some changes. Um, so in particular, we get a blazer pointer here. Um, there are now some small fragments here that don't actually fit the reference anymore. So as you can see, there's still a vacuum that's still the same vacuum, and the pant lag is still the same pant lag. Other parts of the vacuum are still the same. But now we all of a sudden have a face, uh, an eye, and the face around it that's purple. And OK, maybe here the skin has also become purple. Over here also the skin has become purple. Uh, so we call them variants. Right? Um, so how this arises is you have one reference genome from some database. But now the, if you actually sequence the genome from a human, uh, that guy is really unique. Um, it's probably not going to exactly match the reference genome in your database. So there will be genetic differences in the actual sequencing data relative to the reference genome, and it doesn't fit perfectly. So what does that mean for mapping? Well, um, there are still some reads that uh, can be mapped correctly. right? So first of all, there are ones that um, just are unmodified because a large fraction of the genome is still the same even for different humans. Like we're we're largely the same, you know. And it's just tiny differences between humans that make us look different from each other. Um, but it turns out even some reads that uh, contain variants can still be mapped. So if you look here, there's only a small part of the read essentially, the the part of the skin that's purple up here, that's changed, while the majority of the read still looks like before. Uh, down here also, we have the hand skin color that's changed, but the large part of the picture is still the same. So in those cases, the reads can still be mapped correctly since there's sufficient context in the read. But now if you have um, reads uh, which are much significantly different, basically, so they they have almost nothing to do anymore with the original. As you can see, OK, there's some similar colored hair here, but let's say 50% of the read is completely different. And over here also, like 50% of the read is entirely different from whatever the original reference genome is. Uh, these reads here would completely fail to be mapped. Um, and that's because we only consider a refer single reference genome. And the fact that these reads fail to map is called reference bias. And why is it a bias? So it's biased towards whatever is already in the reference genome. If you look at the reads up here, we were able to map anything that we already knew about in the reference genome, but all the interesting parts, all the new parts that we aren't aware of, we had difficulty to map or, or couldn't map at all. So we're biased towards anything that looks similar to a known reference genome. Um, that's undesirable, of course. So how can we avoid this? Well, a first naive solution perhaps can be um, to map to all known reference genomes one by one. Now, um, consider we have n reference genomes. Uh, maybe these are four vacuum salesmen, four potential vacuum salesmen. And um, that gives you an n times slowdown. 
And now you get further issues. So there could be uh, unknown reference genomes, hybrids, right? You can't really assume you have a database of every possible reference genome. As imagine you have 7 billion humans on the planet. Um, where the hell do you get the database from everyone's genome from? Um, and even if you did, uh, can you really afford a 7 billion times slowdown to avoid reference bias by mapping to every single person's genome one by one? It's really not a feasible solution. Um, so this would probably uh, remove the reference bias, but it's, it's not a tractable solution, both from data availability and from computational efficiency standpoints. Um, now the second option, that's the realistic one, is to build a graph-based reference that unifies all gene non-genetic variations. And what's cool here is that uh, this avoids uh, any redundant computation and data. So if you see up here, um, for example, all the white parts and much of the hair, it's really the same even in different reference genomes. There's really no point in doing uh, the work n times over when it's the reference genome is, is largely the same um, and just different in small places. So having a graph-based reference, as I will show in a second, avoids all of this redundancy. And the second cool thing about graph-based references is, is it even captures unknown genomes. Um, so how can that look? Uh, so suppose you have um, this, re this uh, reference graph now. So this is the graph you would construct from these four uh, reference genomes. And essentially you have you kind of your, your baseline graph. Of course, in a graph, there's really no baseline image, but for visualization purposes here, we have our baseline image and then we store only whatever is different from the baseline image. So you would have like a pointer here that says, okay, instead of the regular face over here, you could have this face or this face or this face. And then we would have another pointer over here that says, okay, instead of this hand, you could have alternatively this hand, this hand, or this hand. Um, but the key point here is that now we can't just capture the reference genome of this guy, for example, with purple hands and purple face, but you can see combinations. For example, we could have a purple face combined with these uh, very light, uh, light skin toned hands. Um, so we're getting all combinations of possible reference genomes all of a sudden from all known variations. And this is much more comprehensive than just, yeah, these four known reference genomes. And it's also much more efficient because of all of the redundancies gone. Okay, so that was uh, the visual uh, introduction to this. Now let me go back to the, um, to the let's say, string sequence based representation. So uh, yeah, we want to um, combine a known linear reference genome with all genetic variations um, to get rid of reference bias. So suppose we have this uh, original reference genome as a graph, it would look something like this, just a single node that contains all of the text. Now, if you have a, a known variation at some point, let's say this T here could be replaced by a G in some known variation, then how we represent this is we split the node into two and we uh, insert alternate paths. So we can have either ACG, then T, and then ACGT again, which would correspond to the top sequence, or the other alternate path would be going over the G node. And now we can have another alternate sequence. So we have instead of a T and the G, we can have an insertion even with two Ts. So here we can go from the first T, we can take a detour over a second G to ACGT again. That corresponds to an insertion of a T from here to here. And then we can have a fourth option. Suppose there is a deletion here. So these colored uh, characters are deleted entirely. How you would represent this is just by having a shortcut edge instead. So you direct the go over there without going over any of the intermediate nodes. Um, okay, and then you can imagine that somehow in software or uh, in hardware, you somehow need to have a graph data structure that just stores these as pointers. The edges are pointers and nodes just are still strings. And uh, yeah, then you now, so now need to figure out how to do sequence alignment on that. Uh, so 
what I just showed you is uh, the genome graph construction over there. Uh, it's a pre-processing step, so um, I hope you can envision how that roughly looks. You could maybe come up with a pseudocode for it, um, but it's not typically performance critical. So we don't consider it on the critical path. You would do this once for all known reference, uh, for, for the known reference genome and um, all the known variations. And then, okay, maybe every now and then you need to update it if you have new known variations. But in general, you don't reconstruct this every time and it's off the critical path. Um, as in sequence to sequence mapping, you have this indexing step, which is also considered a pre-processing step and not part uh, of the critical path. Um, now, uh, what's part of the online path, uh, what's part of the online step, so critical path, is uh, seeding, uh, filtering, chaining, clustering, and sequence to graph alignment. So we construct the graph, we index the graph into a hash table based index, and now we get reads. And what we do with reads is we extract small sequences from the reads, we query them in the index and check which parts of the reference graph might fit well. And we call, we call those candidate mapping locations. Then we filter out the worst ones with some filtering algorithm, hopefully very efficiently. And then the remaining candidate locations are aligned with sequence to graph uh, pairwise alignment. Um, so here you only get a subgraph of the full reference genome. Um, and it's, it's kind of a, a region of the graph that's around the candidate location. So you evaluate each of these regions with pairwise sequence to graph alignment, and you output an optimal alignment um, between those two as a cigar string again, as we do in sequence to sequence alignment. OK, um, so the key issue here is really how we do this sequence to graph alignment. Seeding and, uh, well, chaining, let's skip this for the moment. But um, seeding essentially works exactly as in sequence to sequence mapping. Um, these offline processing steps, okay, we can kind of envision how to do them, but the key pointer is this very uh, computationally expensive and yeah, frequently used sequence to graph alignment step. Um, now, recall again, in the previous lecture, we discussed Genasm and Scrooge, and what those algorithms handle very well, especially in hardware, is sequence to sequence alignment. So if we visualize sequence to sequence alignment, um, if you plot your y, your query read on the y-axis and your uh, reference genome on the x-axis, then computing each cell uh, here, yeah, you, you would compute each new cell from three neighbors essentially. Right? And the key point is in sequence to sequence alignment is always it's a direct neighbor. Right? It's there's no gap in here. It's always just the character over to the left and one above and one diagonal. Now, in the graph-based reference, um, the problem is you also have to consider hops or shortcuts, edges, or, or maybe edges that are missing. So if you yeah, linearize your graph like this and just draw edges wherever they need to go, now all of a sudden you don't just have direct neighbors anymore, but you have the direct neighbors plus these kind of indirect neighbors um, that are not directly connected to that new entry we're calculating now. So all of a sudden you have to uh, have this kind of irregularity in your computation that depends on the data. That's really annoying to handle efficiently both on the algorithm side, but especially in hardware. And I will show in a second uh, how to do this in hardware. Um, first of all, though, we when we did our work here, we looked at uh, what already existed out there, of course. And we noticed that um, there are software tools for this. Um, and in those software tools for sequence to graph mapping, the alignment step is the bottleneck. So the sequence to graph alignment is costly. It's very computationally costly, just like in sequence to sequence alignment. Um, in particular, it suffers from high cache mit rate, miss rates. And over there, also the seeding is just inefficient. It's not a new problem. So seeding is also um, yeah, kind of inefficient in sequence to sequence alignment. You need accelerators for seeding as well over there, but 
um, especially in these software tools that are just not accelerated yet at all, that becomes a worse issue than in sequence to sequence mapping where there are some accelerators for seeding already. Uh, finally, those um, baseline tools, they scale sublinearly, so you can't just have much larger reference graphs and expect good scaling. Now, we also try to find prior harder solutions. So clearly, uh, we complain a lot that software isn't efficient enough, it's not accelerated enough. Um, we should look for whatever exists in terms of hardware solutions. Uh, can we leverage maybe existing sequence to sequence mapping accelerators? And it turns out that sequence to sequence mapping accelerators, they cannot just directly be leveraged into graph mapping. Like you, you can try to come up with, with schemes of how you can kind of reuse them partially, but at the end of the day, sequence to graph mapping is a strict uh, superset of the operations you need uh, than for sequence to sequence mapping. So uh, basically, sequence to sequence mapping just cannot handle those indirect edges, the hops in the graph. So you cannot use the existing accelerators. Now, instead of go looking at uh, remapping accelerators, we also can consider um, graph accelerators. So there are all kinds of graph algorithms out there that already have um, accelerators for them. So there are like, for example, accelerators for graph traversal. Um, I mean, okay, you could envision that maybe those can be leveraged directly, but it turns out that you really need a specialized accelerator for this. You cannot just take any off-the-shelf graph accelerator that just happens to handle also sequence to graph alignment. Um, so for hardware, we really had to come up with our own, and um, this is Seagram. Our proposal Seagram is the first universal genomic mapping accelerator, and it's universal because it can both support a sequence to graph mapping and sequence to sequence mapping, and it can do both for both short as well as long reads. That's why we call it universal. So it is, we, we came up with this accelerator by helping harder co-design. So we both designed hardware and fine-tuned the hardware to the algorithm and kept refining algorithm parameters and the exact algorithm layout such that it would fit the hardware very well again. It consists of uh, two steps here. So the um, seeding algorithm is based on minimizers and uh, the um, uh, pairwise alignment algorithm for graphs is based on a bit vector based alignment algorithm. Um, so if you recall last lecture, uh, Jonathan Scrooge bit vector based, that's the algorithm that's talked about here, um, bit vector based alignment. So those are kind of innovations on the software side. Um, we have to make seeding work uh, for graphs. It's not too difficult, but you have to do it. Um, and then you have to make this um, bit vector based alignment work on graphs as well, which is a bit more tricky. So, okay, it's labeled software here. Maybe we should call this rather algorithm contributions. Um, and then the second contribution is that we create a very efficient hardware accelerator um, for all of this, so we took those um, we took those algorithms, we designed hardware, and we kept iterating back and forth between algorithms and hardware to get a really efficient combination between the two. Okay, um, so what's uh, this accelerator that we came up with? This you can see a nice block diagram here, um, and yeah, we don't have you don't have to understand each small step right now. I would direct a paper for that, um, but maybe I can give you an insight into how you would come up with this accelerator if you had to do it. So we have two components here, um, min seed and bit align. So this is essentially the seeding accelerator and the alignment accelerator. Um, and then uh, we have those attached to some uh, main memory because we need to access the reference graph all the time and some indexes all the time. And then we have a host CPU uh, from where we would get input reads. 
Okay, so now how do you implement this as a hardware algorithm? Well, you just break down the task into small sub-problems that you can implement in Verilog, let's say. Um, so if you have this block diagram and, and each of these blocks does a very, very really manageable small task that's not complex at all anymore. So for example, here we start from the host CPU, we get a read. Okay, let's store it in a read scratch pad. So a scratch pad is just an on-chip memory. Um, then we have a small computational unit that just looks at the scratch pad. It extracts all k-mers, so length k substrings from the read, and it just calculates which of those are minimizers. This is this minimizer strategy, which I believe I've introduced before in the course. Um, anyway, you write these minimizers to another scratch pad, so on chip memory, um, and now you have a list of uh, seeds to look up in your index. Right? Your index is stored in main memory, so we look up um, frequency, so essentially how often they occur in the reference uh, genome. Um, and then we have another computational unit that just kind of discards any seed that occurs too frequently. This is kind of a filtering step. So the idea here is that um, if a seed occurs very, very frequently, um, in the reference genome, that is just not an interesting thing to look at. It's it gives you too many locations that probably 90% of them are garbage anyway. Um, it's, it just doesn't give you helpful information for your mapping process. So anything that's too abundant in your reference genome that has too high ref high frequency, we just discard in this module right away. Now, once we discard those, anything that re remains, we check the index for its seed location. So this would be a graph node, essentially. Um, so where, uh, in which graph node did this uh, current kmer or this current minimizer uh, show up? Um, once we find it, we obtain candidate uh, seed regions. Um, how you do that is essentially you look, OK, um, this is the node in which uh, the camera showed up. We have a read of 1,000 characters, so let's just take 1,000 graph nodes to the left and 1,000 graph nodes to the right. That's our subgraph now that we uh, continue processing on. So this subgraph, this candidate region, um, we sent that to the input scratch pad to pairwise sequence alignment. Okay, so that was seeding. So we obtained minimizers, we queried the index, did some filtering, um, obtained the uh, appropriate candidate region, and sent it to pairwise alignment. And the pairwise alignment accelerator, uh, we um, generate bit vectors. So generate bit vectors means um, we have a computational module that executes something close to the Genasm algorithm. Um, here there is a new component, hopqs, um, that doesn't exist in Genasm, and I'll go into this in a second, why we need this. Uh, and then we send the generated big vectors to a, not a scratch pad, and finally perform traceback as you know it from Genasm. Then finally, uh, we have um, the outputs, of course, sent back to the CPU that sent us the input read. Okay, so it's a nice round trip along uh, this block diagram, and each individual step here really does a very, very simple task. Um, if I gave you a pseudocode for each of these algorithms, hopefully you could implement some very log based off of this, or at least implement it in C. It should be really manageable. Okay, so um, let's look at these two components, so MinSeed and BitAlign in some more detail. So um, MinSeed com consists of three computation modules, um, then some scratch pads in between and some memory interfaces to query the index. Um, now the computation modules, they're not just logically easy tasks, they're also um, cheap to implement in hardware. And then the scratch pads are fairly manageable. So if you look at their sizes, it's just about 50 kilobytes. That's really acceptable um, in terms of footprint. If you compare that to a to a CPU, for example, CPUs have megabytes of cache. Um, so 50 kilobytes in on-chip memory is kind of fine. Um, 
there's also some double buffering going on here. So essentially, you always have one copy ready in the scratch pad to send on to the next uh, stage. Um, so you always have a buffer in between such that there's always input ready to work on again. This uh, reduces your latency and, and makes sure that your critical path remains short. Um, the uh, memory that's attached here, this main memory, is HBM. Um, the idea here is that you have high bands to your index and your, to your reference genome. Um, I think we did some evaluation uh, over that, that we don't really saturate uh, all of the available bandwidths, but um, the parallelism of HPM is really convenient. And it turns out HPM is also reasonably energy efficient and enables us to integrate it um, closely, at least, to the HPM memory. Which reduces data movement cost. Okay, so the um, beta line hardware is based on a, a linear linear cyclic historic array based accelerator. Um, so again, I keep referring back to Juvenasm here, but they're really um, tightly uh, combined these works, I guess. So um, this is essentially the hard to design from the Juvenasm work. And again. I refer back to the previous lecture. Uh, if you want to have low level details of this algorithm, I went into a lot of detail in that lecture in terms of how these algorithms work and how they can be improved. Um, but yeah, um, this already uh, exists basically, this historic array based accelerator. The thing that's really missing here um, is hops, so these uh, indirect edges in the graph. So let me remind you in case uh, you don't know or have forgotten what the linear systolic um, array is. Essentially, it means you have compute uh, elements or processing elements, PE, um, and they are connected um, in a well in a linear array. That's why, uh, that's why it's called the linear systolic array. Um, so you have an array of these processing elements and they have some wires between each other okay and then each cycle of your computation they do a little bit of computation uh, so this is this I think it's called a processing core um, it's a very simple uh, logic unit essentially that does some amount of processing and then it writes its output to a register and then in the next cycle it passes whatever it computed on to the next module so you compute a little bit, you pass on. You compute a little bit, you pass on, and you always receive something from your direct neighbor. The key point here is that this works really efficiently, and it works as long as the data that you need is always the data from your direct neighbor, to your left in this case. Right? So if this guy only needs data that this guy just worked on in the last cycle, all is fine and dandy. It works highly efficiently. Um, it's great. This works for sequence to sequence alignment, but in sequence to graph alignment, recall in the table that I showed earlier that you have to handle these indirect hops in the graph, right? So indirect edges from non neighbor nodes. How do you handle this? Well, you need these hop queue registers. So essentially, you keep storing um, whatever your left neighbor computed a few cycles in the past. So I think we considered up to 12 cycles in the past. Um, and, uh, okay, let me quickly. <laughs> Sorry for that interruption. So uh, we considered um, something up to 12 cycles in the past, basically what this guy computed. Um, so this guy can basically look up to 12 neighbor nodes in the table to the left. Mm. So yeah, and, and okay, there's some challenges over there in terms of how many cycles you consider. Um, and there's an accuracy performance trade-off, uh, which we analyze in our paper in depth. Uh, but it, it turns out that something like 12 cycles is actually sufficient in practice to get good accuracy. 
Okay, so uh, these hop key registers are a key innovation over Genasm, and all of a sudden we can handle graph references. Um, now, uh, the full uh, Genasm, uh, uh, sorry, CGRAM module, um, basically we have one accelerator instance, uh, which consists of MinSeed and BitAlign. So each, uh, one of these accelerators each I just showed. Um, it's attached to a host, and then it's attached to one channel of an HBM2E stack. Now, we can have uh, many channels per HBM stack. So we can also have many um, Genasm accelerators. We just stack them basically horizontally, and you can have many accelerators in one place. And then uh, conveniently, since these yeah, HBM stacks are fairly cheap, we can also just have many copies of these. Fortunately, this entire mapping uh, process is a um, data parallel task. So we can just have more accelerators as we want it at low cost. Um, but yeah, we call this one module and we now revelation, we consider four of these modules, which turns out gives us kind of reasonable throughput for mapping. So we evaluate uh, three use cases for mapping, um, sequence to graph mapping. So in this case, you would use uh, both modules. Then you can have a uh, sequence to graph alignment. So you would just use min seed or some other seeding um, algorithm, but then uh, use just the bit align hardware. So you can use these modules independently, or you could just do a uh, sequence to sequence alignment, in which case also you would just disable the min seed component and use bit align um, for the sequence to sequence alignment. And finally, uh, if you just need a seeding accelerator, of course, you can just use MinSeed on its own also. Um, if for whatever reason, you don't need the highly efficient pairwise alignment. Um, yeah, we evaluate all those use cases in depth. I think I will go into on the subset on, uh, of these right now. Um, but essentially, we uh, implement the entire design in system very log. And then it's a combination of um, uh, synthesizing, simula um, uh, basically simulating scratch pads, and then um, yeah, spreadsheets for throughput numbers. Um, then we do a bunch of um, performance measurements of software baselines, as well as uh, yeah, we check out the numbers that these hardware baselines report in their original papers. Um, that we have a uh, human reference genome um, and VCF files as the graph reference. So VCF files are essentially what we, the, um, I think it's a variant calling file. Um, essentially it stands, it, it contains the list of all known variants that you're considering in your graph. And then you build the graph from the human reference plus these variants. Um, and then we have a bunch of uh, simulated reads for both short and long reads that we evaluate with. So on the synthesis side, we get area and power numbers. Um, and uh, OK, it's you don't need to look at this entire table. Um, just some key points here. Uh, first of all, if we have four of these Seagram modules, this is a fairly cheap um, accelerate to build. So consider that the entire thing uses only up to 24 watts. Um, so 24 watts, that's much, much less than a regular CPU in, in your desktop PC even, never mind in a server CPU. Um, so we're doing very well in terms of power. And interestingly also, uh, it's, it's really the compute module that takes the majority of the power. So the HBM memory, the off-chip memory, um, is not taking up too much power, which is good because we'd rather spend uh, our power on computation. Uh, also, in terms of uh, yeah, what, what's the bottleneck on, in the accelerator, uh, it comes down to the uh, uh, bit align logic. So even the accelerator um, pairwise alignment is expensive in terms of both area and power. Um, and then the bit vector scratch pads are also similarly expensive. Um, 
Now, maybe I'm blowing my own horn here a bit too much, but uh, this is exactly ba basically what uh, Scrooge improved significantly these bit vector scratch pads. So we could see even more significant improvements uh, by applying Scrooge's algorithmic improvements on top of Seagram. Um, so yeah, if you have uh, some computation and the on-chip scratch pads that are the main expensive thing, in total, we're still very energy efficient and also area efficient. Both of them are much more efficient than a CPU. Um, and off-chip memory is kind of reasonably cheap. OK, uh, now let's also compare um, to software baselines. So this was kind of a harder evaluation. Let's compare the throughput to software baselines. We already saw we're doing well in terms of power. And now here we're plotting throughput on the y-axis and different read sets on the x-axis. Um, and you observe that for the software baselines, Graphaliner and Vici, a Seagram uh, significantly outperforms these, such as by 5.9x and 3.9x respectively for uh, long reads. Um, and power consumption over CPU by 4.1x and 4.4x. Uh, on short reads, we do the same evaluation. So we plot a throughput on the y-axis, higher is better. And we have a range of short read data sets and the same software baselines, Graphaliner and VG. And you observe that uh, for short read mapping, we can have significant, even more significant throughput improvements, um, while power consumption is also uh, reduced significantly over the CPU baselines. Um, then we also compare to Pascal. So these previous baselines are for mapping, sequence to graph mapping. Um, Pascal can only do alignment, so sequence to graph alignment without any kind of seeding, for example. Um, so we just compare Pascal with the bit align accelerator. And you observe here that for both short and long reads, again, uh, bit align provides significant speed ups over Pascal. Um, now, for fairness, right? we also evaluate sequence to sequence alignment because simply that's the only place where there exist any harder accelerators. So the only uh, graph baselines so far were software um, because there's simply no hardware accelerator for graph alignment. But uh, to have at least an idea of where we stand, we also compare to sequence to sequence alignment accelerators. Um, so clearly there are some overheads in Seagram. Um, the fact that we can handle sequence to graph alignment means that there are these uh, extra hop queue registers, which come uh, in terms of area cost and power. Um, but it turns out that they do not cost us performance. So we still have high throughput, um, equally high throughput, for example, as Genasm. Um, so for that reason, uh, Seagram uh, has, yeah, or, or I guess um, Bitaline has significant uh, throughput and um, uh, throughput improvements, and it's still competitive in terms of power and area. There are some overheads again due to these hop key registers, um, but they're kind of manageable, and it's at least even faster in terms of throughput. Um, and same thing for short reads. So um, yeah, Seagram does well. <laughs> uh, OK, so there are many additional details in the paper, including yeah, how we pre-process the graph in detail. Um, we write down all algorithms and hardware designs. Um, we analyze why existing tools are slow. And then um, we, of course, uh, explain in detail our data sets, baselines, performance model. Um, we have some additional results. For example, uh, we analyze over there um, how we need to size hop queue registers um, to get good accuracy and performance trade-offs. Uh, we explain why uh, Seagram uh, has improved efficiency over sequence to sequence and sequence to graph baselines. And then we um, do a good breakdown of the Genasm versus Seagram comparison that I hopefully also convey to you in this presentation. Um, now, let me conclude uh, with a short summary. So um, Seagram is the first universal algorithm hardware code design genomic mapping accelerator that supports both sequence to graph and sequence to sequence mapping for both short and long reads. 
uh, it consists of the min seed and bit align accelerators for seeding and sequence to graph alignment respectively. It supports multiple use cases such as end-to-end uh, -end sequence to graph mapping, sequence to graph alignment, sequence to sequence alignment, and seeding. And uh, we observed that Seagram outperformed state-of-the-art software and hardware solutions uh, in these use cases. So this was our paper that we had in uh, ISCA 2022. It's definitely worth a read. I can recommend that definitely. Uh, all our code is on GitHub. Um, so it's all open source and available for you to check out. With that, uh, I will conclude here. Thanks for your attention. And I hope to see you again uh, next week.